Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. I want to open up with a scripture reading, Psalms 95 and 6. And it reads, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we start our service? Father, as we enter into your gates tonight with thanksgiving and to your courts with praise. Lord, we gathered in this place tonight. Lord, we just want to take some time out to let you know we love you tonight. We want to take some time out and let you know that we appreciate you, God. We're grateful for all you've done, Lord. You have been our sustainer and our keeper today. You have been our protector. And, and Lord, you brought us in this place in this appointed time to lift up your name and to give you praise and to give you honor. And Lord, I pray tonight that you rain our minds in from our today's activity, God. Rain our mind in from our failures and our mistakes, and God, and in those disagreements and those arguments, and to the one that is able to correct and the one that is able to fix them, the one that is able to lift our heavy burdens, to restore joy, and to give victory. And Lord, we pray as you rain our minds and our hearts in tonight, and Lord, we pray that you usher us into your throne room tonight, that we may see and join in on the worship that is going on in your presence. Lord, as we, our mind reigns in, give us a visual picture of the worship that is going on in the throne room, God, where the elders are down at your feet, God, and worshiping you, the Lamb of God, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. And Lord, we pray that we may join in in that worship, God. That our posture will be as the elders, they worshiping our King and praising His name forever and ever, and that we may receive glory and honor. And Lord, we pray during the, the fathering of the service that as your praises go up, the blessings will come down. As the praises go up, the hearts will melt and the hardness become a soft heart. As the praises go up, healing will take place. And as the praising go up, the burden will be lifted and peace be restored tonight. And Lord, we thank you and we expect great things because you are a great God. And let everyone in the house say amen and amen. You may have your seats in the presence of God. I want to welcome everyone to Harvest Midweek Service. So glad you're here tonight. I'm sad. so glad to see so many youth in the service tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for our youth. Amen. Praise God. And I think it's the first Wednesday they're out of school. Amen. And they're, they're here and worship with us tonight. I just want to uh, thank God for you. And if you're a guest tonight, I want to say to you, I'm glad you're here and to welcome home. And uh, you might have come as a guest, but I pray that you leave here as a friend. And if you haven't already, fill out a connection card, want a record of your visit. And also, uh, on the back, you can put your prayer requests. And not only your prayer requests, if you're in need of anything, let us know. We want to be a blessing uh, to you. Amen. With our, with our uh, connection card. Amen. Y'all ready for a good time tonight? Amen. Amen. You're ready for a word. Amen. Amen. But a uh, powerful word is coming a little later. But at this time, can I get you to turn your attention to the screens for our announcements? And then pastor will become after that. We will be reordering the Harvest T-shirts if we have enough people interested in getting one. Please sign up in the lobby to reserve yours today. Membership Matters, Sunday, June 9th, after service. If you would like more information on uniting with Harvest Christian Center in local church membership, or just want more information about the church, please plan to stay for this short meeting. Golden Harvesters, a ministry to age 50 and over, will be meeting Friday, June 7th at 11 a.m. in the chapel. Sharon Collins will be speaking, and she and Laura Thomas will be hosting. Bring a covered dish and a friend. Churchwide prayer meeting this Sunday at 6 p.m. Baptism is being offered Sunday, June 16th, Father's Day.
baptism class will be offered Sunday, June 9th after service and Wednesday, June 12th at 7 p.m. If you would like to be baptized, please plan to attend one of these classes. The annual summer celebration for the Alpha Conference and Bishop Mike Gray will be held at Harvest Christian Center. Pastors and other congregants from all over the Alpha Conference will be joining us. The speaker for the conference, Dr. Terry Trammell, will be preaching Wednesday through Friday at 7 p.m. This is going to be a great time of revival for our church, and we encourage everyone to come out for these three nights of celebration. These have been your harvest announcements. Check your bulletin for other announcements and opportunities for ministry. All right, good evening. It is time for us to receive God's tithes and your offerings tonight. So if you've not already had an opportunity this week to give, and to give your tithes in. Uh, let me also add that tonight, if you would like to give an offering that's beyond your tithe already given, uh, that will help us with the ministry of pastor and cartoonist Joe McKeever. Did anybody get sketched tonight? Somebody said it got real sketchy out there in the lobby. I know, it's a poor pun. I had to try. I had to try. At least our guests weren't in here to hear the puns, so that saved you from being embarrassed about your pastor's poor puns, poor pitiful puns. Anyway, if you'd like to help us, they are senior citizens, and we're just trying to help a few retirees get back home at the end of their ministry week. So bless you for all that you can do in helping with our tithes and offerings tonight. Let us pray as they receive the tithes and offerings. Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to give and to the work of the kingdom of God. We're so grateful that you've blessed us. We just acknowledge tonight that everything we have, Lord, it belongs to you. And we just want to thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Everything we stand in need. Of. Father, you've been faithful to provide for your people. And tonight, as we give back to your work, we pray that we'll be able to sow, Lord, blessings into the kingdom of God that will be returned, Lord, as we continue to see your faithfulness unfolded in our own lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. And everyone says... Praise God. Well, while I'm up here, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to introduce our speaker, Pastor Joe McKeever. will be stepping up into the pulpit to provide our spoken ministry tonight right after our praise team is done leading us in worship. Pastor Joe McKeever is here tonight, and um, I have just about made up my mind, uh, Pastor, that if you'll just leave Sister Bertha here, she's much sweeter than I imagined, so she can stay, you can head back. I, I know you've got other things to do. I appreciate you, Sister Bertha, where are you at? Uh, the way that you have been interacting with our congregants and just being a blessing to us this evening. Let me tell you a little bit about Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe is a native of Alabama. He's the son of a coal miner. Uh, Pastor Joe has been saved for more than 68 years, been preaching the gospel He's been preaching the gospel longer than many of you have been alive. He's been preaching the gospel for over 58 years. His great ministry during his retirement years is not only continuing in preaching and teaching, but also in writing. Writing is a form of ministry as well as the cartooning for religious publications that he does. And he's blessed me and helped me out in many of a ministry situation where I was able to rely upon his help for prayers as well. As I've already made mention, of Sister Bertha, please do know and understand that she is the best thing that's happened to him in the last two and a half years. Somebody say amen. amen. I know he'll probably reiterate that statement here in just a little while. Uh, Pastor Joe did spend 42 years of pastoring Southern Baptist churches, and he also spent five years as a director of missions for the churches of the Metro New Orleans area. I'm not going to go into his full list of qualifications and education. Just know that he's very well educated and has a lot of experience that he brings to the pulpit tonight. Two latest books that he has written I want to talk to you about. They are both widows. They are both married for 52 years before they married a little over two years ago. And together they have written a book called Grief Recovery 101 that will be a great blessing to you. Please talk to them and see how you might pick that up for yourself tonight. Also, a book of cartoons that they have put together, 60 and Better, Making the Most of Our Golden Years. That will also be a blessing to you. So without further ado, let me turn the service over to our praise team, and then Pastor Joe will be coming to speak to us in just a little while. Praise God. This is going to be a great night. Amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to start tonight by doing some interactive praise and worship. By that I mean whatever, you know, just kind of put your music where your mouth is. Amen. So when you say, can somebody tell me where... 
north is to cantonment? Is it that way? Okay, so when we say north, well, everybody's going to point north. That means south is this way. East, west. No, see there? Okay, here we go. offering a praise. Can you do that tonight? Amen. Praise you, Jesus. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing just to sit here at your feet and worship you.
So glad to be with you at Harvest Christian Center tonight. Thank you, Pastor William. You are one brave soul. <laughs> Bertha and I have been to South Florida. Uh, our daughter and son-in-law, Pastor Church in Delray Beach. So we came down uh, over the weekend and I did some preaching and drawing for them uh, Saturday night and Sunday in the neighborhood, had a uh, barbecue on Monday and I drew everybody there and then we left out Tuesday. And so uh, I'm doing revival actually this weekend at uh, Olivet at the church in Milton. So when Pastor uh, William found out I was gonna be here, I said, can I draw your people or anything? He said, yes, and speak to my people. So thank you, I am honored, I really am. Um, tell you this about the drawing. I was five years old and my mother did what your mother did. Remember when your mother put you at the kitchen table when you were a little kid and she put, gave you pencil and paper and said, sit there and stay busy and out of my way so I can get my work done? Well, my poor mother had three in school and three at home. She was always cleaning and cooking and working. I remember the day she put me and my three-year-old sister, Carolyn, at the kitchen table, gave us pencil and paper, said, sit there and draw. What she meant was stay busy and out of my way. But I discovered that day that I loved to draw. And I kept doing it. And the next year, when I went to the first grade, the other children would gather around and watch me draw. And to this day, I can outdraw any group of first graders you will ever meet. <laughs> My wife, Margaret, used to say I was the oldest person in the world whose mother still put his artwork on the refrigerator. My sister Carolyn owns the farmhouse now in North Alabama. And Mom lived to be almost 96, so she died in 2012. But Carolyn has left two or three things on the fridge that uh, I had drawn for Mom. I have to tell you this, women get in front of me and they say the same thing that hundreds of women before them have said. I've heard it tonight two or three times. I'll, I'll say, now look at me and smile. And the first thing they'll say is, make me beautiful. <laughs> and I say, the Lord beat me to it. Just shameless. <laughs> and, and they say, make me thin. And I say, prayer room is down the hall. <laughs> and they say, they say, take the wrinkles out. And I say, I say, they don't call me Botox Joe for nothing. <laughs> I, wherever I go, I draw. I'll be drawing over at uh, Olivet Baptist Church. I mean, it's just kind of what I do. And uh, in fact, about six weeks ago, Bertha and I were in, in uh, Michigan doing this for the Lutherans. And, uh, and so here we are, in, in next week we're gonna be in Birmingham, Southern Baptist Convention. Anyway, um, I, I'm always surprised at what people say when they sit in front of me. I, I was drawing at a church over in Georgia where I had preached that morning. And uh, I saw this, I had a crowd of people there, you know, I was drawing and I saw this woman over there, she's sort of a cut up and she was playing to her audience. So when she sat in front of me, I said, I, I said now look at me and smile. And she said, just draw one of my chins. <laughs> and I said, what shall I do with the other three? <laughs> and give her credit, she laughed harder than anybody. Um, some of you have met Bertha. Bertha and I were married for 52 years. She to Gary and I to Margaret. Gary and I were classmates in seminary back in the 1960s in New Orleans. And we knew each other for 50 years, but I didn't know his family and he didn't know mine. And, um, and, and they, they pastored churches in Boston, different places around, and served as missionaries to Malawi and Brazil. And they retired back to Jackson, Mississippi. They're Mississippians and retired back there uh, in 2005. And 2014, somebody put it on Facebook and said, Dr. Gary Fagan is, has had an aneurysm. He's in the hospital and we're praying for him. His wife has a Facebook page. So I, I went there, left a note, said I'm a friend of Gary's in school together. And then I wondered, well, do I know his family? Because you're all in school together. Surely you ought to know each other. 
And I clicked on the photographs, and I said, she's got to be his daughter, it can't be his wife. And, and a few months after death, the Lord took my wife, and a year later, a year after he took, took my wife, we were living in the New Orleans area, and my son said they were moving from New Orleans to Mobile. I was not going to have anybody living there in New Orleans. I'd been there since 1990. I was so tired of the hurricane season. You know about hurricane season. And I was just so tired of it. So I started praying, Lord, if you have somebody for me for the rest of the journey, here's what I would like. So I gave the Lord my order. I said, intelligent, godly, sweet and humble. Attractive is good, but please notice it's number five. You and I have all seen old guys sometimes make attractive one, two, three, four, and five, and live to regret it. Number six, I said, uh, let her not have any complications in her personal life, like grown kids who lay around the house smoking dope. <laughs> you marry her and your life becomes about them. And later I thought of number seven. I said, Lord, whoever it is, and I knew it was nobody I knew. I said, Lord, whoever it is, let us both know it up front so we don't play games. And one day I thought of Bertha. I had seen it. She once in a while she'd put something on Facebook, but not much. She's not on there very much. I, I, I'm on there every day. And anytime Bertha put something on there, it was just something very sweet and supportive. I'm praying for you, love you, that kind of stuff. Never clever. Clever is what I try to do. But hers was a sweet. So I sent her a note. And I said, you're still in the Jackson, Mississippi area? She said, yes, I teach English at the community college. I said, I get through there a lot going to preach. Would you ever be interested in meeting for lunch or coffee? She, she, she said she would. We met on Monday, February 15, not the 14th, but 15th of 2016. And uh, I had been in five churches in the Mississippi Delta that weekend. I was worn out and I had driven to Jackson late Sunday night and then had spent several hours on that Monday drawing at the state office there because of retirement of one of my friends. So we met for lunch at 1.30 and we knew that week that God had put us together. In fact, 24 hours after we met, I'm back in New Orleans, we're on the phone, she's in her backyard at, back in Mississippi and we're talking and I told her the seven things that I had been praying. And she told me she had been writing in her journal 25 reasons why I will never marry again. <laughs> and the big one was that she had had 52 years married to the greatest guy in the world. What are the chances of Act Two to follow that? When my family members have met her, they've all fallen in love with her because there's nothing not to love. And one of my sisters said, Joe, God is rewarding you. And my brother said, Maybe so, but the question is, what's he punishing her for? <laughs> anyway, so I'm so delighted to love this lady and to be loved by her. She is a prayer warrior, believe me. And I want to talk to you about praying for just a few minutes. I want to, I want to give you some encouragement about praying. Now, I want you to know up front, I do not consider myself an expert in prayer. In fact, I don't know that anybody is or has the right to be. I picked up a book one day but written by one of our preachers and it, it said on the back of the book that he was an expert in prayer. I, I don't know why that offended me, but, but it sort of did. It made me think, I, ha I have, um, uh, there, there are four of us in my brothers and sisters, and there are four of us boys and two sisters and we love our mom and dad, every, you know, they're in heaven now, but we love them dearly. And can you imagine one of my brothers or my sister telling everybody I'm an expert in talking to mom and dad. I would be offended by that. I'd say, what's the problem about speaking to mom and dad? You know, mom, they're right there, they listen, they love us. And that's kind of the way I feel about talking to the Heavenly Father. What's the problem? What's the problem? Um, my wife and I, somebody the other day gave her, we, we met one of our granddaughters, we met her perhaps future husband, and he brought Bertha a book by C.S. Lewis on how to pray. So here we are, we're both, she's about to be 79, I turned 79 in, in, uh, in March, and so we've been praying all of our lives, and written, we've read, I've written a great deal about prayer, I read it, but I still want to learn what other people have to say about this, so much more to hear, and so we're riding on the interstate, and she's reading 
depth of those chapters, and it's so worth doing. Um, I want to give you two or three insights from Romans chapter 8 tonight, please. In fact, when you leave here tonight, I, I, we, we've actually printed out my notes for you so you can just have a copy. So we'll give them to you when, when you leave. I don't want, if we give them to you right now, you won't hear a thing I say. You'll be looking at that. So I'd like, like to have your attention up here. Romans chapter 8, um, there are three verses in particular. I want you to say verse 26 here. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. Now look at that. We do not know how to pray as we should or as we ought. Now everybody, listen to that. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. Well, I knew I didn't know how to pray as I ought. I figured you didn't. I didn't know the Apostle Paul would admit it. So if you've ever felt that your prayers are so weak, welcome to the club. So here's the verse, Romans 8, 26. But it's a powerful verse for a lot of reasons. Notice he says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Come back to that in just a minute. The reason is we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I have no idea what it is like in the throne room for the Holy Spirit to be interceding for us with the Father. But it gets more complicated because I want you to see verse 34. Same chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Who is the one who condemns? It's Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. My friends, verse 26 says the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Verse 34 says the, Holy, says the Lord Jesus is interceding for us. Are we in luck or what? Two members of the Trinity are interceding for us. If you wanted some really bad theology, you could say the Father is outvoted before he ever starts. However, the good news is, verse 31, right in the middle of all of this, says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The point of verse 31 is that God is for us. Everybody say that, please. God is for us. Now, he does say, if God is for us, but he's not saying if God is for us. He has established the first 30 verses of Romans 8 that God is for us. The first 30 verses of Romans chapter 8 is like, like a, a braid. Like, you know, you women sometimes do one braid. Okay. Uh, there are three themes in the first 30 verses. God the Father is for us. God the Holy Spirit is for us. God the Son is for us. Now, if, if, you, if you ask uh, William Strickland, who used to be the editor of your denominational paper, if you ask him, write us an essay on these three subjects, and you got 30 verses, he'd do 10 verses on one, 10 on one, 10 on one. I would. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. He writes them all together and braids these three all through. So for 30 verses, he established God the Father is for us, God the Son is for us, God the Holy Spirit is for us. Comes down to verse 31 and says, now, what are you going to say to this? Well, if God is for us, who can be against us? So he's saying, since God is for us. In fact, verse 32 hits it out of the park. Look at that. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You think God's going to play hard to get? He's already given us the best heaven has. God is so for you, it is ridiculous. He loves you, loves me. He is more, more for human rights than any liberal ever has been. Mark chapter 1. A, man, a leper comes running up to you. Mark chapter 1. Now this, is, this is not on the screen or in my notes. I just want to tell you. Mark chapter 1. A leper comes running up to Jesus. Excuse me. Turn me off. Can you turn me off for just a second? Bertha and I fighting the last little vestiges of the congestion. A leper comes running up to Jesus. 
violating the, the, the law. The law said leprosy is a normal person. Stay away, call out on the place. Leper comes running to Jesus, falls before him, and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Lord Jesus said, I am willing. And he did the unthinkable and touched the untouchable. I am willing. You can write that across the, on a banner across the chest of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am willing. Not willing that any should perish, the Bible says. He came from heaven. He, oh, thank you. He is on our side. He is for us. Mark chapter 2, the second chapter. Lord Jesus is in this house. He is, he's teaching. The place is packed out. They're hanging out the windows and the doors. Nobody can get in. Four men go down the road, get their buddy who's paralyzed, but bring him to Jesus for healing. And then they can't get him in the house. And they don't know what to do. But he's paralyzed. He, that means he does not have control over bodily functions. They can't wait out here for hours. They've got to do something now. They take him up the outside steps onto the flat roof of the house, open the roof, just tear open the roof, lower him into the room. Wouldn't you have loved to have been in that room when the ceiling started falling? And the people in there lowered him down. And the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of these four men, he did something really strange. Now, why did they bring him? They brought him there to be healed. But the first thing the Lord Jesus did was he said, Son, your sins be forgiven you. So he healed him. He, he forgave him of his sins. Then he healed him of his infirmity. Well, listen, nobody asked him to forgive the guy of his sins. Why did he do it? He was just eager to do it. That's why he came, to forgive people of sin. I am willing to. He said to the leper, he was so willing to forgive sins. Why, in the third chapter of Mark, you're going over there, here's the Lord Jesus in the, in the, in the synagogue in Capernaum. And it's, it's the, uh, uh, the Lord's day. It's a Sabbath. And the, the, the hypocrites you know, bring in a man with a withered arm, just daring Jesus to heal him on the Sabbath so they could use it against him. And the Lord Jesus knew it. In fact, the Bible says he was angry at their hardness of heart. But he did it anyway. He knew he was going to stir up that bunch and did it anyway because he's so loving to this guy. He doesn't care what, the, what these idiots out here do. He just is loving this guy. That's the Lord that we serve. He is, the Father is, is for you. The Son is for you. The Holy Spirit is for you. Why aren't you praying? Here's the... The sad fact, 95% of the things you pray for, you will never know whether God answered them or not in this lifetime. You pray for the president. You do, don't you? First Timothy 2 says pray for the kings and those in authority over us that we may live peaceful lives. You pray for the president, your leaders, but you don't ever get a phone call from the White House. The president would like to thank you for praying for him. Here's what happened today as a result of your prayers. That doesn't happen. You pray for missionaries and for ministers, but you're not there and you don't know that today, because of your prayers, they were saved from an accident or God empowered their witness and they led somebody to Christ or a thousand other things could have happened. You don't get a phone call from Northern Italy. Thank you for praying. Here's what God did. If you can't pray for the missionary and leave it with him, you'll quit praying. And some have quit praying. If you can't pray for the president and leave it with him, you, you'll quit praying. And some have quit. You pray for your children when they go off to school. But when they get home from school, they don't say, hey, mom, hey, dad, here, grandpa, here's what happened as a result of your prayers. They, they don't know you're praying. You don't know what God did. When they get home, you say, honey, how was school? And they say, fine. If you can't pray for the children and leave it with God without knowing what God has done, you'll quit praying. And some have quit praying. Oh, my friend, pray. I want you to go back up to verse 26. I want to show you something that will bless you. <coughs> I know whether William does this or not, but uh, us times, preachers I know will say, now the Greek word here means so-and-so. And I tell these pastors that most of the times when you say that, your church members roll their eyes like, oh boy, you know, Greek, he understands the Greek. Well, here's your good one. Right there in verse 26 where it says, likewise the Spirit also 
helps us in our weakness. The word helps, five letters in the English, but the Greek word that it is translating is 17 letters. 17 letters. It's a compound word. In the Greek, it's synanti lambanomai. It's made up of, of several parts, and I'm going to give you this on, in the notes here so you'll have it. But syn, S-Y-N, is a prefix meaning together or with, like synonymous or synonym. Anti, A-N-T-I, you're familiar with that. Anti means against or over on the other side, in front of. And the last part, lambanomai, is a form of a Greek verb meaning to lift. So here's what he says. The Holy Spirit gets on the other side of your weakness, of your burden, of whatever it is God's asked you to do, and together with you lifts it. You men, any of you ever try to pull a crosscut saw all by yourself? It's practically impossible. But if you get somebody on the other side, opposite to you, facing you, working with you, you cut that tree down, you cut those logs, you cut the whatever. Um, when you make the bed up in the mornings, if you're by yourself, you're running around from one side to the other. But you know what? If you've got someone on the other side facing you, you don't even have to move. And the Holy Spirit is working with you on that. And this, this, let me tell you what this tells me. Now listen to it again. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I think, I think our prayers are sort of like baby talk when they get to heaven. Um, and the Holy Spirit says, Father, here's what they're saying. Now, if you're a mama or a grandma or a grandpa, baby talk is just about the sweetest thing you'll ever hear. And sometimes mamas can tell you what that little baby is saying with those little gagas and goo goos and things. Um, but it would be such a mistake for us to quit praying because my prayers are so weak. And we must not criticize each other's pray prayers. Let's encourage each other to pray. The Lord Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. You will not know what your prayers have accomplished when you pray for those nations. You pray for the United Nations. When you pray for the people who are trying to stop abortion, God, please stop abortion. I pray for the Supreme Court Justices, Lord, give them courage to do the right thing, wisdom to see it, and to do the right thing. God help our nation. I believe America is about as lost as I have seen it in my lifetime, certainly as polarized as it's ever been. I urge you, pray for America, but we'll get to heaven before we know what God has done, how he has used our prayers, and we'll be so glad we prayed. We'll be so glad we pray. One of the ways we encourage each other with our prayers is tell each other what God has done through our prayers. Can I give you a prayer story? And then I'll conclude with this. Monica grew up in my church in New Orleans. In fact, her father was chairman of the committee that brought me there in 1990. And Monica came from a godly family, two sisters, and they were all so wonderful. And uh, Monica went to McNeese State University over in Lake, Lake, Charles University, uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And she majored in early childhood edu education to become a preschool teacher. Well, and she would spend the summer uh, doing summer missions, working with, you know, going, one summer went to Hong Kong and worked with missionaries. Well, when she graduated, our denomination has, has a program for brand new college graduates, 160 every year, that we call the journeyman program. And 160 godly young people are chosen every year and sent overseas to work with our career missionaries. And they're, they're usually working with children or teenagers, whatever. Well, Monica applied, and she was appointed to Tanzania, a country over in East Africa, to work with the kindergarten there. 
But Monica told me about this not long ago. She said, but Brother Joe, I was praying that God would write it in neon because this is a two-year assignment and you don't want to just go overseas for a two-year assignment if you, if, just on a hunch that God wants you. You want, you, want to, you want to know and know for sure. Well, as soon as they graduate, the whole class of 160, they're flown to Richmond to their offices of our International Mission Board. And we have a center outside, like a big campus there, you know, where they, like, a, like a retreat area, where they spend six weeks getting ready to go overseas. So they teach them about witnessing and engaging people of different cultures. And one Saturday, they bus the entire group, 160 of them, four buses into Washington, D.C. And they drop them off in little clusters and they give them three hours to do four things. For the next three hours, you are to observe internationals, eat some international food, engage some internationals in conversation, and bring somebody closer to Jesus. Well, Monica's group was dropped off at Union Station at Wanfalo Railroad Terminal there. I first came in there in 1961. It's still a working station, but not many trains. But it has probably spent, they probably spent a billion dollars on refurbishing. It is a, a really upscale shopping mall. It's so impressive. And uh, so Monica's group was dropped off there and they spread out. Well, two hours into the, her assignment, Monica's about to panic. She's not very aggressive or assertive. She's very shy. And uh, she pulled off into a little corner and she started praying. She said, Father, I'm not doing very good. I've seen the internationals and I've eaten their food. I really haven't talked to you. I certainly have not brought anybody close to Jesus. And Lord, you're just going to have to show me that you really want me to go to Tanzania. But she got through praying. She looked down the corridor there and she saw some tables like you would have in your fellowship hall with arts and crafts on them. And there's a tall black lady standing behind the table. Monica goes down that way, nods to the woman, picks up a little item that she recognized. She said, we called it a finger piano. The woman behind the table told her its African name. And then the woman said, it's Swahili. It was made in Tanzania. Monica said, oh. I'm going to be moving to Tanzania. <laughs> and the woman said, where will we be moving to? She said, to Dar es Salaam, the capital city. The woman said, I live in Dar es Salaam. What will we be doing there? She said, I'll be teaching kindergarten for the Haven of Peace Academy. And the woman said, my two granddaughters go to the Haven of Peace Academy. They've come home telling me about Jesus that he loves me, that if I should get in trouble, I should call and he, he would hear me. Monica's having industrial straight chill bumps up and down her back right at this point. An hour later, when they left, they had prayed together, and the woman had sat there and written letters to her two granddaughters and given them to Monica because Monica would be seeing them before she would. And when she got to Tanzania, she became the teacher of one of those little girls. And God did an amazing work in Monica's life over there. She not only ministered to kindergartners and her parent, their parents, but also God gave her a ministry to teenagers, to hundreds of teenagers. I, I told her I figured God was up to something because of the dramatic answers of prayer. Do you think God has favorites? Do you think he does it for her but wouldn't do it for you? Are you praying? Are you praying? Let us pray now, please. And when you get home, pray. And when you lie in bed tonight, pray. And when you wake up, pray. And when you are driving, pray. Pray without ceasing. And when you get to heaven, you will see the amazing things God did because you prayed. Pastor Fred's going to lead us now in our closing prayer. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. 
Lord, you're so good to bring us a word that we need in due season at the right time. For many of us here, perhaps all of us, we needed to hear. You need to pray. So, Lord, tonight, we come to you. And we pray. While we're just pausing right now, I want you to pray in your heart what you need to pray. Maybe some of us here with a, a need in the family. Maybe some of us here a need in our own hearts for Jesus to come in and be the Lord of our lives. If that's you right now, right where we are, let's pray. I'm going to pray for a family that just had a granddad to go home to be with the Lord. His name's Connie Booker, a boy I grew up with. And so I'm going to pray for that family. Maybe you have something you want to pray for, you need to pray for. Lord, you know every heart tonight. You know what we're praying. You know what we're thinking. There's not a thought. There's not a thing that you don't see. There's not a need that you don't see and not a need that you don't want to meet here tonight. And so we bring our needs to you tonight. I bring Connie Booker's family to you. Even some that are right here, some grandchildren that are here in this church. That are kin to Connie. And I just cast my cares upon you right now, the cares of this family upon you. We cast our cares on you, Jesus. We bring them to you. We ask you to heal the broken to bring deliverance to the captive now. To set at liberty those that are bruised. To forgive our sins. If that's you right now, do that. The story of the blind man that Jesus healed, he made clay, put it on his eyes, and told him to go wash in the pool. Many people that day ask, how did this happen? How did this happen? And sometimes we don't know how the Lord, most of the time we don't know how the Lord's going to do something, but we know that He will do it. You may have something in your heart tonight, something in your situation, that you don't know how the Lord's going to do it, but you can know that He is going to do it. The Pharisees said, how did he do this? How did he, how did he make you well? They were trying to trap Jesus, trying to trap the man, wanting to kick him out of the synagogue. Now, you may not know how it's going to happen, but I want you to say, Lord, I thank you that you're at work. And right now, the Holy Spirit is interceding. And Jesus is interceding. you to thank him for what he's doing let's thank him right now that he's hearing our prayers he's forgiving our sins he's setting us free in the name of Jesus Lord I thank you and I give you praise I thank you and I give you praise I don't usually do this but I, if you're thanking the Lord right now just like the teacher would say, would you raise your hand in the room? The Lord sees it. We're not looking. But Lord, I thank you. Would you just lift the hand to him and say, Lord, just wave at him and say, Lord, I thank you that you're answering my prayer. Thank you, Lord. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you all as you go.